Speaking of dudes, speaking of superstars, it is time to welcome on Greg Pruitt, former Browns running back to the show. Greg, how you doing? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing all right. What happened to all that money when I was playing? <laughs> Greg, yeah, we had know. we had a, a Brad Sellers is in our text chain. I don't know if you if you know Brad at all. Obviously, played in the NBA for a long time, and he was Brad. kind of saying the yeah. same thing. Of he's happy that you know, of course, he's disappointed. He still has to work today, and, and that money wasn't there when he played like it is today. But he's thrilled for the younger generation that uh, that these guys are are sort of reaping the rewards of the work that you did and that Brad did, and sort of paving the way for these guys. Well, it's, it's a rough sport, and uh, when you get my age, you realize how rough it is. You pay, you start to pay for it. So, uh, and, but you know, it's worth it's worth the risk. You know, I got six grandsons, and uh, we're at that crossroad. I got one that's uh, sixteen, uh, about to go into college, about playing football in the stages of football. But I have to do say that they are making efforts to try to control the game as much as they can in terms of, you know, being more physical than you need to be. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious, since you, you brought it up, are you comfortable with kids in the family playing football? Knowing how you feel today, knowing how your body feels now, are you still a proponent and supportive of kids playing? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I, I, I think that uh, they continue to make efforts to try and uh, make the game as safe as possible. Uh, no leading with your head. I, I mean, the game has changed quite a bit since when I played. I mean, after seeing some of the guys being uh, kicked out of the game, especially in co college on some some of the questionable calls, uh, I knew a lot of guys wouldn't play a lot of games because that's how they play. Greg, when I was doing some research for this interview, I came across maybe the biggest flex humanly possible, the Greg Pruitt rule. You have a rule named after you banning yeah. tearaway jerseys in the NFL. Is there any way to have a bigger flex than have a name, a rule named after you for what you did on the field? Because that seems to be maybe the coolest thing in the history of the entire world. Well, I tell you, I was glad to see the rule, and I was glad to see them ban the jersey. Uh, when you play in a game, I'm in a game, and that's 30 seconds between plays. Teams go out and they do scouting reports, and they know pretty much, they know pretty much, and down in situations, most likely when I'm going to get the ball, how often, based on that information, I would get the ball. So on some plays that they thought I was going to get the ball, guys would actually tear my jersey before the play even started, and then it became it should have been unsportsmanlike conduct. <laughs> but it became an infraction to me. So I had to leave the field, change, be back in the field all within 30 seconds. So I can't tell you how many times they holler. It's two, three. I have no idea, you know, what kind of defense I'm confronted with or what kind of adjustments they made. So it, it was a, a, a one less thing to worry about for me when they banned it. How many jerseys did you have off to the side on the sideline? Oh, a lot. I think I think I went <laughs> the most I ever hold through probably was like five jerseys in a game. In a game. And that's, that's just part of it. Now, we live in Cleveland. We know that it gets cold in Cleveland. Yeah. And so in order for that jersey to, wet, to work, you couldn't wear anything under it. So that meant I had a short sleeve T-shirt on, and it's like sub zero out there. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't fun time for me. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy, Greg. We see the pictures flashing on the screen during some of the montages. And, you know, we talked to Leroy Horder about this when he, when he comes on the show. He's a, he's a weekly guest during football season. But those big shoulder pads are something else, man. I got to imagine you would have put up an extra, you know, two, 3,000 yards if you had normal, sh normal size shoulder pads back in your day that were more aerodynamic, not slowing you down, right? Those things are crazy. Well, I think they did get the ability to protect us. Uh, you know, my style kind of helped me a lot. I, I, if I could see you, you couldn't hit me the way some guys I saw get hit. Uh, the, the, the hardest I got hit was from behind Julius Adams in the New England game. He hit me in the top of the head with his with the, his fist. He traced he chased the play. They turned it back inside, and he was fast enough to get over and hit me. In the, and then they, uh, uh, it was timeout, 
this is how they checked back then because I heard bells. So <laughs> I, I walk off the field and uh, I sit on the bench and the doctor come over and he, he says, how many fingers is that? And you get three chances to get it right. And then the big question was, what day was it? Because we all know we play on Sunday. So if you said anything other than Sunday, something was wrong. <laughs> Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, you know, Greg, uh, you know, we I, I look at the Browns, and I always tell them, you know, the Cavs won the championship here. And, you know, I, obviously, you know, this is a Browns town. And I always imagine what it would be like to see the Cleveland Browns. You know how they got all the pomp and circumstance on Super Bowl oh, Sunday, oh, right? Oh, oh. Unbelievable. I, I think about think about just seeing the jerseys coming out there on the field. And God, the Lord willing, if they win that game, could you? T- could, I mean, what would that be like across the Browns community of so many people that that, that have have watched their, their loved ones go on that love the Browns and always wanted that? That would just be a special day, wouldn't it? Definitely. It'd be huge. It's, it's unimaginable um, how much celebrating we could do uh, if the Browns won it off. Crazy, crazy. Greg, do you keep up with the current team at all? Oh, yeah. What do yeah. you think about Nick Chubb? And was his, would his running style have translated to any era of football? Well, you know, I think I'm third in terms of, of uh, yards from the line of scrimmage, fourth in terms of uh, uh, running the ball, rushing the ball. Uh, and Chubb is going to push me down another slot, look like in, a couple of other guys <laughs> in front of me. Chubb is, Chubb is special. Uh, his biggest gift is he has great vision. He is way faster than we think he is. Mm-hmm. And he has great balance. And, and, you know, Greg, to, to kind of uh, get that a, a little bit, I always, last year, I said it, I sat here, and, 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 you know, my partner, Jay Crawford, he sat here, and I said, now, look, Nick Chubb get by 18 carries, right? To me, if, if, I, if I got a Jacoby Brissett back there, and I know Nick Chubb get, got me 1,500 yards on 18 carries, I want to see him get 24 carries. I want to see him get nope. 25 carries. Do you think that sometimes that the Cleveland Browns go, they don't, they go away from what, what, what some people would consider their bread and butter? Oh, I have the same frustration that you have. I'm a running back, but I concentrate on backs. And I see a lot of situations in games where there's a play that pretty much can win the game for you. And a lot of times it was running the football. Nick Chubb rushed for the yards he rushed and never got the opportunities that he should have gotten to get the yards he got. He's a quiet guy, uh, don't have a lot to say, and I think the Browns are lucky that he has that temperament because uh, if I was in that situation, I'd be <laughs> talking about not getting the ball a lot. You know, running backs, when you're in the game, you, you, ha- you have to feel the pulse of a defense. You have to feel the speed and quickness of a defense and there's some adjustments that you make, but it's a battle between you and the defense. And you know, as the game goes on, if you either winning that battle or you losing that battle. And when you win it out, you want the football. And uh, I can see that in the games and the, the, the Browns should see that too. We've almost lost games where if they just he, get a ball to Nick Chubb, I, I, remember, I, I think it was a Detroit game uh, that I went to that he actually won the game, and they was doing everything they could not to get him the ball. And finally, they gave him the ball, and he won the game for them. I thought, well, at least I'm not crazy. At least, at least, at least somebody who done, who done done it for a living like yourself at a very high level understands that frustration. Because I'm like, are y'all trying not to give it to him? Is he sick? Is he tired? Yeah. Did he, did, is his kid sick at school? Did he need to leave early? Where was Nicholas Chubb at? Yeah, but you see, I believe I think Nick gets upset about it, but I think he takes it out on the defense when he do get the ball. <laughs> Greg, we, we talked about this time after time again on the show here, but we, we all feel that this this is the season that it's kind of all in for the Browns, that the pressure's here, the ingredients are there. Now it's time to go out and prove it. 
From yes. a player's perspective, can you guys feel not the outside pressure from media, but just the internal pressure of it's kind of a make or break year for us? And, and how do, if you can, how does that affect preparation and how you guys go about handling your business? Well, I think that the Brown have the personnel and have had the personnel, but they didn't have the depth. And then they were unlucky that they got key people hurt. And because they didn't have the depth, it affected them more than it, it should have if they had had the depth. So the Browns got to stay healthy. And that's, you got to be lucky enough to stay healthy because you can do all the things, be in the top shape and whatever. This game, any given play, could be your last play of the season or it could be your last play of that game and for four or five weeks and all that affects the outcome of your season. Uh, I think Deshaun Watson is what they think he is. I, I think he's a great quarterback. I think no matter how good you are, if you're off for two years, you're not in the competition, you have to play the games to get back the chemistry you need to get as a quarterback to be effective in the NFL. This is going to be his first year after playing last year of preparation. And we got some people behind him that I think that that, that option that they run where the back hands it to the quarterback, puts it in the quarterback, and then he, he pulls it out if it's not for that and runs it himself, I think it's going to be one of the better plays. The guy he's got the ball in the pocket is Nick Chubb, who has great vision too. I, I, I'm, I can't wait for the season to start. Greg, are you surprised at all at how the position has been devalued across football? Oh, yeah. I, I, I think you have to be smart. Uh, Cleveland Browns, again, I just alluded to how bad the weather gets here. That means that God don't want you to throw the football. So you're going to have to. <laughs> That's a quarter That's of That's a great line. That's a great line. Make sure we clip that. Yeah. <laughs> what a line. <laughs> They can't just put it all on passes. You can't throw the football. And when, when you guy like Nick Chubb, okay, we're gonna give, we're gonna take what the defense gives us. And if that dictates sometimes running the football rather than passing the football, then that's what we should do. We should never force passing the ball with a running back like we got. But just the punishment that you guys take, that that position takes. And then to not be rewarded financially to the level of some of the other positions that we see, it just feels like it's just a meat grind. It's become a meat grinder spot where you just wear this guy down to the nub, throw him out, and go find someone else. I, I think the, the, the league thinks that throwing the football is a more exciting, and that's really what the fans want to see. Uh, and somebody is going to pay for that philosophy because all teams are not set up that way. But uh, the smart teams will have a balanced uh, offense, a good defense to give opportunities to the offense, an offense that takes advantage, and those are the teams that are going to advance farther than the other. Greg, I got two questions for you based on uh, some attire in your shot here. What's on your hat real quick? I was wondering the same thing. Oh, ain't but one hat like that. It's, uh, I had a lady made this for me, and it's a dog. And okay. it's has dog pound on the back. Oh, that's, sweet. That's okay. Fire. And it has my number. It has Pruitt. So she made it for me. Okay. Now, that makes sense. Now now I see the dog. Yeah. I was struggling to figure oh, out what no, it was. Oh, no, I've seen it earlier. I was like, I don't know. I like see that also hat. over your left shoulder, you have the Jim Brown jersey. Obviously, Jim passed away earlier this year. Rest in peace. Do you have yeah. a, you know, you guys are both in the Browns running back fraternity. Do you have a Jim Brown story or maybe a little Jim Brown insight you could share with us today? Well, I know he was very compelling. Uh, unfortunately for me and a lot of young guys, the great thing about golf is age has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Old guys will kick your butt. <laughs> so we played in a golf – where the Browns had their annual uh, barbecue and golf tournament, and we played. And then afterwards, a couple guys decided we wanted to go continue to play so we went to highland golf course which is traditionally uh, people say it was jim brown's golf course when he played for the brown that was a course that was hard to beat jim on so uh, we went over and we played uh 
nine holes at uh, well, we played eighteen holes at Highland, and I was neck to neck and neck with Jim going to the eighteenth hole. Now Jim did not know that everybody plays on the golf course, and there's one hole that you just don't like. You just never do well, and it just beats you up. For me, uh, eighteen was that hole. So I'm neck and neck with Jim on 18, and uh, he hits a ball on the green, and I hit a ball like two feet, and I got a birdie. That was the first time I got a birdie. It was the first time I got anything other than a par or a double on it, but he didn't know that. But he was so upset that he lost on that hole that he said, we're playing tomorrow. <laughs> so, okay, we can play tomorrow. So overnight, the weather changed. And it was almost, I, I would say, like 25, 28 degrees. So I got up and went to the golf course. Me and, and Ben Davis, I went to the golf course anyway because I didn't want him to say that I got lucky and beat him. Then I didn't show up. I, I, I was going to squash all of that, although I was hoping we didn't play because it was just too cold. <laughs> so I go to Highland, and Highland has, a, they were remodeling the, the, the uh, clubhouse. They were building. So they had a, a trailer out there, a construction trailer, and people were and the office itself was still open. So that was one car under a, a, a telephone post with a light, and I pull up and it's it's freezing. And I tell Ben, you think uh, you think you think that's Jim's car? Well, we didn't know his car because he he lived in L.A. and he he rented a car when he came in. So anyway, I went up and I get out and it starts the rain, it's drizzling. And I go over to the car, and before I could knock on the window, the window comes down. He, he has electric windows, and it's Jim. I said, Jim, hey, I came to play, man, but look like we, it ain't going. He said, it'll stop. I said, what you mean it'll stop? He said, we going to I said, we gonna. He said yeah, we're going to play. So I said, mm, okay. So I go back over to Ben, and I tell Ben, he wants to play. I said, he said, all right, okay. So Ben, he, uh, Jim gets out. Of his car. When he gets out of his car, he got jeans on, no socks, <laughs> a sweatshirt on, short sleeve. And he gets out of his car, takes his regular shoes off, puts his golf shoes on, still don't put socks on. And he puts a windbreaker, <laughs> a windbreaker over his sweatshirt. I got Gore-Tex and I'm freezing. <laughs> so we go out and we play. And man, I'm telling you, it's just miserable. This is like, a test of wheels, I guess. I, golf, I, that was the last thing I was thinking about. So after nine holes, we got back. You know, you got to cross. And so Jim said, I don't know about you guys, but I had enough. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I had enough. I said, is that a forfeit? He said, call it what you want. I said, okay. And he didn't know I, I was gonna, I was going to quit before he said that. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he's very competitive, and That's he's a good great. golfer. He really is a good golfer. I I, uh, I tell kids all the time, you when, when you're real, real young, you don't know what's in your future. You try to do the right things, uh, make the right decisions, uh, and things work out for you. And, and know the person that's giving you advice, loves you, and gives you the best advice they can give you. When I was about 10, 11, 11, or 12, something like that, uh, we used to watch the games on TV, and I remember watching the Browns play the Giants. Sometimes I see a highlight, they show it on TV. And Jim Brown runs a sweep to the right on the on the Giants. Instead of running out of bounds, he plants his foot right at the sideline, and he drops his shoulder, and he uh, runs over the guy that was trying to hit him, and he runs for like 40 yards for a touchdown. So when this game is over, everybody – is all fired up, want to be uh, Jim Brown. And so we go out and play football. So it was so many of us, we decided to pull straws to see who was going to be Jim Brown. And uh, one of my friends named Charles Law, uh, he got the uh, he got the chance to be Jim Brown. And we go out to play, and we play tackle. And he runs a, a sweep, and you can see he could turn the corner and have a touchdown. He slows down, and he's trying to reenact what he saw on TV. And uh, he drops his shoulder. Three of us hit him. We broke. We broke both of his uh, legs and his arm. <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> so he come back. So he left for a long. He left for a long time. After that. All these years later, I'm playing Jim, and I tell him the story. I said, at first I asked him. I kind of said to him, I said, Jim, how it feels? Everybody, you know, everywhere you go, everybody know you. Everybody love you. Everybody always, you can't, there's no problems. I said, how you like that? He said, well, yeah, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. I said, well, I got some bad news for you. He said, what? I said, well, I know a guy, a uh, friend of mine named Charles Law. He lives to this day. And I told him that story about how it happened. And Jim looked at me and he said, you know what? That proves that proves the point, don't it, Greg? I said, what? I said, what does it prove? He says, only one Jim Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> well, Greg, we appreciate you taking some time to join us on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show today. Those are the kind of stories we can't get That's right. anywhere else but from a appreciate Browns legend himself. Greg, best of luck. Yeah. Stay healthy, and we appreciate right, you man. spending some time with us. Thank you, Greg. All right. Thank you.